Hi, welcome to K9 Capers. I'm your host, Karina Thomas. Today we're visiting Topps Kennel with Alex Roth Aker, who's been training dogs in agility, police protection, and obedience for nearly 25 years. Haven't you wondered how a police dog can pursue a suspect over all sorts of obstacles and terrain? Well, today, Alex, with the assistance of McHenry County Sheriff Andy Zinke and his canine partner, Jake, are going to show us how. What we'll do, we'll let Andy put his dog up. <clears throat> Once he gets up here, you're going to actually see how this is going to vibrate. He'll let it vibrate. Okay, now we're going to have Jay come down. He's going to walk on this beam. It's a four-inch wide beam that also is not only solid, it vibrates a real lot. And what we teach the dog here is to counteract the balance on the beam. If you notice, it vibrates right away. What the dog learns to do is go slow to counteract the balance. You can watch how Andy helps him with his back feet. He has to place it very carefully and get the dog focused again on the beam. Teaches the dog, now gets real solid right here. Now we're going to have to walk all the way to the end. The trick to this is there's a complete turn here. The dog has to get his rear legs all the way to the end of the beam. And what's very important, he has to move his left leg, back left leg first before his right. You can see the dog attempt to move his right leg first which would cause the dog to fall. And you'll see Andy help the dog. He puts a right leg back and the dog learns to use his left leg. Again, he walks down the beam. It's very solid. Now he comes up to the part that shakes again. And he stops the dog so the dog can think about what he's doing and getting his balance. If the dog would go fast, the dog would fall right off. Now you can see again, the dog is going slower. Now he's counteracting the balance. You can see how still he gets right here. And that's what we're looking for the dog to do, to counteract the balance and just relax. Now you can see him stand, not shaking at all. Now have the dog come down. The dog will jump with his front feet first, then his back feet. Let's have a hand for Jake there. Very good. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to have Jake walk up a spiral staircase by himself. First, the dog is taught to walk up with the handler. Now we're going to have the dog walk up by himself. He'll have the dog focus on a staircase. You can watch how he walks up. Real calm and slow. He's going to walk along the top. And again, Andy's going to ask him to jump up come down the stairs again slow, not running. Any dog can run downstairs. What we're teaching the dog here is to go slow again. And again, he steps in very slow, gets at the end. Now I'll make him heel to his left side. And what we're going to show you next now is another exercise we teach the handlers to do. He's going to take his dog and place him on his shoulders and carry him up the stairs. When he gets to the top, he's going to turn around and carry the dog down the stairs. Again, this is taught to have trust for the dog, to have complete trust in the handler. A lot of dogs will not allow this. That's what we work with. Let's say if a dog broke a leg while he's out in the field hunting for a bad guy, what he would have to be done, what would have to be done, the dog would have to be carried back to the car. He could not walk. And again, this is where this comes in handy. A lot of times when you're doing police dogs, if they're checking an attic in the old house where they have pulled downstairs, the dog is able to climb up them, but he's not able to come down. So again, the handler would go up with the dog, put him on his shoulders, and bring the dog down. And this, again, takes a lot of trust in the dog and the handler. Okay, let's, now next we're going to go to a tunnel. And this is where Andy has the dog go up an incline into a tunnel, which is suspended, and it's plastic. So again, if the dog would try to run in this tunnel, he would slip, because the tunnel is moving at the same time. Now you can watch how the dog enters the tunnel right up the ramp. He's going to the other side of the tunnel now. And when he comes down these stairs, again, they're open stairs. They're 14 inch steps apart. So the dog has to again come down slow. You can watch how the dog right here is going to use his back leg, almost slip, but then he uses his other back leg. And he comes down step at a time, step at a time again. This is very important. Teach the dog to go slow and relax. And that's that. We 
just watched Alex and Officer Zinke complete Tops Kennel's most advanced obstacle course, ideal in preparing police and search and rescue dogs. Next, Alex, with the help of assistant trainer Phil Behoon and his dog Lux, will show us how this training can be used to build the confidence in your companion dog. Okay, again, here we're teaching a dog to use his back feet in sequence with his front feet. Dogs do not know how to do this. They know how to jump over things and just follow their body, but they do not know how to place their back feet exactly where their front feet are. This exercise here is completely for that. We have different space beams. We have beams that are high. We have beams that are low. Right here, you're going to see the dog crawl up to a big opening here, and he'll stop the dog at the opening right there, and you'll watch the dog first place his front feet, and then he gets his rear feet all the way to the edge, and now he has to step over with his rear leg, you can watch right here, and this is very careful now. The whole thing to this is he has traction in his back legs, but not his front legs. Now he's going to come up on top here. Again, we do not let the dog just run. We let make the dog rest there for a second, and he'll get situated with his back feet. And he's going to have the dog slowly step up on top. And what's hard about this is there's not an even space here at all. They're all different sizes. Now, when you come to a turn like this, what the dog has to learn to do is place his rear right leg all the way to the edge so he can pivot on his right leg to turn around. If the dog would turn around right from this position he is now, he definitely would fall. Now you're gonna watch how Phil is gonna adjust his back legs. He's gonna pull his right leg second to the last board. Then he'll pull his left leg second to the last board and he'll put his right leg all the way at the edge. Now the dog can pivot without falling. What you're gonna see very interesting, the next time the dog turns around at the other end, you'll watch how he'll place his own legs. Now again, watch him with his back legs, how he's got a feel for the legs. Now again, he comes to the edge. Now watch how the dog, again, has to place those legs. Now he's gonna place the dog's leg up on top here. Now the dog, if you watch the rear leg, has to touch the very edge. Now it places it up again. Now we go down on a decline where the weight is in the front feet which makes it even harder for the back feet. All right, I'm gonna come along. Now the next steps he come to here are rounded. It's very important that he places the center of the foot on the top of the round piece. If he placed it anywhere else, he'd slip off. Again, the back leg must touch every post, if you can see here. Now watch the back legs again. He puts the weight on it, and he pushes it, and he cannot skip a step. Now we have him go forward. Again, he has to place that back foot. It probably takes six hours on this alone just to get the dog to place the feet properly. Probably takes three hours alone just to get the dog used to the handler touching his back feet. I walk forward again, now you're gonna watch this time. When he comes to the edge, we're looking for the dog to place his own feet. Watch carefully here. Right leg goes all the way to the end, that's what we're looking for. Now the dog can turn around and pivot on his feet, have no problem going forward. Now again, you can watch the dog place his own feet. Now we come to the round pieces again. Now we go slow. Very important, the dog walks down the center, not to the edge. But when the dog walks to the edge, his chances of getting hurt are much greater. Now we're going up the incline. You can see it's much better now. Dog's calming down. Now he has to come down, he has to place his back feet again. The whole part of this exercise is to teach the dog how to use his back legs. When you start something like this, 95% of the work is on the handler's part and the dog learns to be trust his owner with the legs and also learns that what the handler is teaching him is for the own dog's safety. Again, now we want the rear leg to step on the end just like it did there again. You can see just these two passes have proved the dog's rear legs completely. Now we come to the edge here. Now we're gonna teach the dog to go down. Again, where he's placing his front feet, it's, it's a slick, decline so the dog again has to rely on his back legs to hold him so he doesn't slide down. After he slides down two feet here, you can watch him slide and the dog has to relax here. He's got to trust his handler here that he's not going to get hurt again. After he slides down, if you notice two feet down, now he's going to come, he's going to get traction in his front feet because it's a ripple edge, but now he loses traction in his back feet. So again, he's learning to use the back and the front feet in sequence. Now again, we're going to come to an area again where he has to look at and step over. I can see the dog focus on that area. Again, we're going nice and slow. The handler's there to help the dog if the dog has problems. 
Again, now the dog's rear feet are at the very edge. There he goes, a nice easy step across. Even though the dog is coming to the end of the exercise, you keep the dog very slow and relaxed. The whole thing to the agility course or this obstacle course is to teach the dog to slow down. Especially this breed here, Dobermans, if they had their way, they'd run right through it. Even at the end here, we're going step by step down. Very good. What we learned today is that you don't have to have a police dog to take advantage of this dynamic training method that's guaranteed to build your dog's confidence. After all, we all know that a confident, well-trained dog makes the best companion. Speaking of confidence and companions, next we'll visit this week's Breed of the Week, the Doberman Pinscher. The German Pinscher, Rottweiler, Manchester Terrier, Greyhound, and several other breeds were crossed to make our breed of the week, the Doberman Pinscher. This is Jackie Wendt, an owner and breeder of Dobermans for 29 years, and she's here to tell us a little bit more about this fascinating breed. Jackie, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Doberman? Sure. Uh, in 1880s, there was a man by the name of Louis Doberman who was the town tax collector, the um, night watchman, and he also ran the dog pound. Uh, this was in the town of Apollo, Germany. Um, on his rounds, he was robbed quite a bit, and so he decided to create the ultimate guard dog to accompany on him on his rounds. What he was looking for was a dog that was medium-sized, compact, very fast, very agile. Uh, he wanted tight skin, and short hair, so there was basically nothing you could grab on the dogs. And then he uh, would crop the ears and dock the tails. Uh, he also wanted a dog that was very sharp and very aggressive tempered, and something that was not afraid of the devil itself. And that is how the original Dobermans were. Uh, to create this breed, he, um, a few of the breeds he used were um, the German Pinscher, the old German Shepherd, which is not like our modern day sh German Shepherd, uh, the Rottweiler, uh, the Manchester Terrier, the German Short Hair um, Pointer, the Weimaraner, um, Great Dane, and Greyhound. Uh, there were no written records of any of this, though, so people don't know for sure. Um, after a while, these dogs were become known as Doberman's dogs. Uh, they were very popular in the area as guard dogs. And when Louis Doberman died, uh, his breeding efforts were taken over by Otto Goller, who was also from Apollo, Germany. Uh, the first stud dog entry for a Doberman was in 1893, I believe, and the first uh, Doberman club was started in Germany in 1899. Um, the uh, first Dobermans to come to the United States were around 18, excuse me, 1908. And in around 1916, some of the very best Dobermans from Germany were sent over uh, to the United States and other countries because of World War I and the famine. And the people there who owned the Dobermans would rather see them go to another country than to see them starve to death or be eaten by villagers or have to be put to sleep because there was no food for them. Uh, the first Dobermans that were in the United States were very sharp and aggressive, as they were bred to be. And when they were first shown, there were judges who were bit. And the Americans, uh, though they loved the beauty of the dog and the, care, the uh, intelligence of the dog, they weren't real crazy about the aggressiveness. So they worked very hard. This was mostly the show breeders, I believe, uh, worked very hard at um, making it giving them a more livable type temperament, a more family type temperament that would work into our type of society a little bit better. Can you tell us a little bit more about the personality traits of a Doberman? Um, they're very intelligent, they're very clever, they're very creative, um, they're very affectionate, they're very people oriented, they want to be with you all the time, preferably touching you, uh, they have a sense of humor, um, 
they can they are very protective even though they are mellowed out they are still very protective um, they are not for everyone though uh, they because they're so intelligent uh, sometimes they outsmart their owners um, and if it's an owner who does not have a strong personality sometimes the dog becomes the boss and because they can outsmart them and trust me I've been outsmarted a few times <laughs> no, they're not for everyone uh, they they can get very spiteful if you you know like leave them home alone too long or something of that sort or they don't like what you're doing they can get very spiteful they can be very strong-willed they can uh, they're not for a very wishy-washy type person uh, I know a lot of Dobermans who rule their house they have their owners very well trained um, so you have to be a very have a very strong personality and you have to be very strict with them when they're younger because they will try to take advantage if they can and they're smart enough to do it are they good with children uh, ours have been excellent with children we really have not had a problem uh, it's probably very important that they be with children when they're younger they learn you know about children uh, but we've had dogs go to homes where after they've had the dogs a few years they had children and the dogs were just fine so there again I think it I think sometimes they pick up the um, uh, the personality of the owners and if the owners like children you know and have a nice way with them I think the dogs pick it up <laughs> why Dobermans Jackie um, I've been in love with the breed since I was 10 years old I would buy magazines uh, with my allowance dog magazines and I saw Dobermans in there and I just fell in love with them they were the most beautiful noble breed that exists so I waited many years to have my first one and I was not disappointed at all and after 29 years, I'm still madly in love with them. They're still the best breed as far as I'm concerned. For more information about the breed of the week, contact the Doberman Pinscher Club of America. Next, we'll visit the Chicago Veterinary Medical Association to find out what we can do about the massive canine overpopulation problem. We all think we're responsible pet owners until our dog gets, our intact dog gets away one time and either gets pregnant or impregnates another female. And we have um, hundreds of thousands of animals that are, end up in shelters every year. In fact, more than hundreds and thousands, millions. We have about 12 million animals that appear in animal shelters every year. And we only have room for maybe a third of those in homes. So the rest of them, unfortunately, have to be euthanized. And, that's, that, and, when we, and we know we can do something about it if we can stop the breeding. So, um, you know, that's the bottom line, and I, and I think the, the reason we're doing this is to encourage people to get their pets neutered. It's better for their health, and it's better, it, it will help control the population problem. Well, let's, let's look at the female first. Why should we spay a female dog? Well, for, the, for instance, if we, we know as veterinarians that if you spay a female under a year of age, actually before they come into heat, we can reduce the incidence of breast cancer by 99%. And that, those, those are facts that have been proven scientifically. We will also reduce the, the problems of, of going into heat, uh, uterus infections. We won't have a dog that's, that's dripping blood and, uh, around, you know, that's having a problem uh, when they're in heat like that. Uh, we also will uh, not invite every male in the neighborhood to visit your house <laughs> or visit your dog when she is in heat. You know, the heat cycle in a dog is twice a year. I don't know if people really knew that or not, but they come into heat usually twice a year. And uh, there's a bleeding cycle for seven to ten days, and then they ovulate, and then they're ready for, uh, to, you know, to be bred. And uh, it's, a, it's a very simple procedure. It's a very simple process, but the fact is that when they're in heat, um, they're attracting a lot of other uh, dogs, particularly males, to the area. And it becomes a bother, especially for the owner. Now, for a male dog, uh, we castrate them for several reasons. One is to reduce any prostatic trouble when they get a little bit older. 
uh, prostate cancer, prostate enlargement, all of those things are eliminated by, by castrating or neutering the male. We also take away a lot of the male-driven hormone behavior, so to speak. Um, the roaming, the, the uh, inter, inter male aggression that takes place uh, when, and for instance, if you walk your dog outside and it wants to eat every male dog on the street, uh, we, we eliminate a lot of that by getting them castrated. But we're not changing their personality, we're just taking away the hormone driven behavior, the unwanted behavior. A lot of times people think, well, I'll spay my dog or I'll neuter my, my male dog and they'll just become blobs, you know, couch potatoes. It's really not true. We do change, by taking the hormones away, we are changing um, their metabolism very slightly. So I always tell people that, you know, after you spay or neuter your pet, make sure that you watch the calories that you, that you give them. You know, count the calories, watch how much you give them, how many treats, etc., because they will tend to get a little heavier. It isn't an automatic thing. Spay your dog and all of a sudden have a pig on your hands, you know. It's, it's, you have to, it's our fault. We have to watch how much we're feeding them. Personality-wise, they're going to be just as sweet and lovely and wonderful as they were and maybe even a little bit better, particularly in the male, as we just talked about. So there's really not too many changes that, that we need to be concerned about. A spaying and neutering is not a reversible process. Um, I think we need to remember what we're doing. In spaying a female, we're removing the ovaries. We're not, we're not just you know, tying the tubes. We're removing the ovaries and we're removing the uterus. And the reason we're doing that is you want to remove the hormone influence. And I think that's important because it's the estrogen, it's the hormone from the, that the female produces out of the ovaries that causes breast cancer and all the related problems that go along with being an intact female. In males, we're removing the testicles. <coughs> we're not just, we're not just tying, tying anything off, we're removing it. So no, to answer your question, these things are not reversible. Well, they heal. depends on, 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 of course, the size of the animal. Um, I, as I mentioned before, um, it's surprising how quickly they, they recover. And when you say completely healed, they're sore for a few days after surgery. Within a week to two weeks, they're back to normal. They're romping and eating and doing all the things they used to do. Make sure you contact your veterinarian or your local anti-cruelty society to spay or neuter your pet. It really makes a difference. For Canine Capers, I'm Karina Thomas. See you next time. Bye-bye. Come on. Come on. There you go. There you go. <laughs>